Thank you very much. I'd like to give a warm welcome from the symposium for General Hill. I don't, but that's good. Okay. Hey, I think um, I just wanted to to pounce on a couple things that I heard in the last session, and and really, um, you know, this is perhaps a shameless plug for senior PME institutions and what they can do to extend land power networks and help theater army commanders, theater commanders in competition. And then, uh, you know, we we also uh, discussed a, a number of um, factors of the operating environment that that these gentlemen address in terms of challenges like operating in the Arctic. So it, it, what I want to speak to for a second real quick before we lose the opportunity is the, is the power of an, of an institution like this working for you wherever you are in the enterprise helping to solve these complex problems. So we talked about enduring relationships, right, and extending land power networks. And what I'd like to talk about real quick is the power of a 10-month in-resident experience in PME, and in particular at senior PME. And I'll kind of work the way back from uh, an example of some of the places that graduates of this institution are serving now, nations around the globe. So since uh, the beginning of this last academic year in September, and, and projecting out through the beginning of June, we will have inducted eight of our partner nation graduates of, the institution, of this institution into our International Hall of Fame. And the requirement for that, one, besides you know, being a leader of character and, and representing the values of the institution, is having risen to the level of you know, commanding general of land forces or armies or an equivalent alliance structure um, in their in their nations or in those alliances, and so just in this year, we will have inducted uh, the chief of land forces or commanding generals for the the nations of Norway, the Philippines, Canada, Romania, Zambia, Botswana, Italy, and Lithuania, and that that's a powerful uh, statement to the impact of, of of PME. And and when you think about those people, all I think came to this institution with their families and immersed in our culture, not just uh, our military culture, but our national culture here for a year. And it speaks to power, I think, in those relationships. And all of them were graduates of this institution within the last decade. So then, you know, how are we staying in contact with them? And this, you know, was an initiative that we'd started, and I think we've strengthened with some prompting from General Flynn as we track our alumni after leaving this institution. And so in November of this year, I had the, the good fortune of a um, Take, uh, participating with a team of Army War College leaders in facilitating an in international fellow continuing education program in Bangkok, in region, with graduates of about this same period of time, this last decade from 2013 to 2022, with uh, about 30 days worth of asynchronous advance work to familiarize them with new doctrine, new concepts, uh, new strategies from a U.S. perspective, and then to get all that richness of their perspective in region about shared interests and shared security challenges. And so, and if you think about timing, we did that in, in uh, Bangkok in November of 2022. Uh, we did the same in Zagreb, Croatia in November of 2021. Uh, Well-timed and certainly not with anticipation of what was to come in February, but when you think about the partners that were engaged there, I think it, it speaks to great opportunity. And then, you know, you can take that all the way back to the current academic year. And we've had uh, a, an experience uh, th for about 40 years now um, inside an exercise called the Joint Land Air Sea Strategic Seminar. And it's a distributed collaborative effort across senior PME institutions. And it's a year-long effort um, led by local teams at all of our service colleges in the United States and in several of our partner nations now. And then it comes together in a collective phase hosted here at Carlisle, and we just did that about a month ago. And this year, there were 100, over 150 students from all the U.S. senior service colleges. And interestingly, uh, we, we also now have the opportunity, and it's going to grow again, I think, next year. We had uh, a delegation from the Swedish Defense University participate in person. We had a, uh, a, a team from the Army War College of Nigeria, uh, you know, actively engaged as a multinational joint task force working subordinated to the the, the students here that were playing the role of, of a combatant command focused on Africa, and, and that gave an opportunity for <clears throat> partnership and them to focus around a Lake Chad Basin instability issue that's very near and dear to their hearts, and, 
and, and, and then uh, similarly, we had uh, the, the nation of Chile represented in that exercise. That will continue to grow every year. So, you know, it's really just uh, perhaps an, uh, an encouragement and an advertisement for those of you that may be working now or in the future at uh, theater level commands and thinking about how service institutions like this can contribute to your theater campaign support plans. And then, uh, you know, similarly, it's, it's taking then the human capital that assembles at a place like an institution of, of the Army War College and, and uh, not leaving anything in reserve in terms of capacity, right, and looking for um, in, enhanced contributions to our service headquarters, to theater army commanders and combatant commanders. I'll give you just uh, two quick examples. Um, about 18 months ago, we designed and hosted for the Army an um, Arctic war game. Uh, that was centered around uh, the multi-domain task force capabilities and their application in the Arctic environment. Uh, we've, we've been asked by General Flynn to um, design and facilitate an Arctic War Game 2.0 that, that gets directly to some of the questions that we talked about here and, and is not just looking at um, you know, the, the Arctic as an operating environment, a physical environment, but you know, increasingly an operational space that we have to contend with. And, and that will be preceded in June of, of this year, 21st through the 23rd, in an environmental security workshop here that will be participated uh, in by many from our service headquarters to include ASA level uh, participants that are interested in that particular problem set. So uh, thanks for entertaining a couple minutes to talk about how a, uh, a service institution, and I know the Command General Staff College uh, does very similar uh, contributions from the standpoint of um, IMET in particular and, and MPEP and other programs that help us, I think, uh, compete in a way that really is an asymmetric advantage as it relates to values and, and engagement with partners. And so that's a good way to segue to just introducing um, my, my uh, partner in crime and, and uh, guest here this week, Don Hill. Uh, when I, I, I share the story up front about coming on board as the uh, as, as the Commandant of the United States Army War College and having uh, Don at the time already well into his tenure at Command and General Staff College and, and Combined Arms Center. And uh, you know, beyond us getting confused or others confusing the two of us for each other, what was particularly valuable is we would talk every month. And, you know, and it was unstructured, it was what, what's, what's in your rucksack, what's hot right now, and how are there opportunities for our two inst uh, institutions to collaborate, and that was particularly valuable for me and, and Don I'm, I'm grateful now in your role uh, commanding at, at the Security Force Assistance Command that we can keep that relationship going um, fo focused on different uh, interests but certainly where those interests align and in educating sen senior leaders and uh, developing strategic leaders so uh, we want to welcome you back to the Army War College and thanks for being a presenter here today and I'll turn the floor over to you please join me in a round of applause and welcome <laughs> And, and uh, thanks, Dave. Appreciate that. And if I could, um, you know, just to pile on to his comment about the power I met. Uh, my, I was class two, 2014. Uh, my, my, one of my classmates was J.J. Berdilla, who was just inducted into the Hall of Fame. He's the Land Forces Commander in Romania. And I was in Europe uh, over Thanksgiving holidays. And one of my stops was in Romania because we have advisors working with Romanians. So I spent about a half a day with J.J. You know, already had that relationship built from our time here together. And so just to pile on, the strength of IMED is incredible. Uh, and that's something that we instill in our advisors as they go out, build those relationships. But then, you know, we've got, and I'll talk about the, you know, one captain, one country, one team. Young captains got a whole crop of them. They're getting ready to go off to the staff college. Uh, and so if, if, you know, cultivated in them, hey, go reach out to all our international partners uh, that are in the uh, PME there with you, as well as I got a group of, you know, second time, SFAB battalion commanders who are now on their way to uh, SSC, same thing, reach out because they've been building those relationships because that is so powerful. And I think that speaks to, you know, we're first in competition, which uh, the previous crew uh, talked a lot about competition. Uh, but one of the things that, that, that I'm gonna talk about is, you know, we, we think that we are critical in conflict uh, and that is, that is part of what we are learning because that is not the context that most folks think of when you hear the term SFABs. And I'm gonna talk about SFABs uh, primarily because nobody knows what an SFAC is. Uh, and I'm okay with that, that's fine. We're, we're, we're at TDA headquarters at Fort Bragg, that's fine. I'm a force provider, but the action arm are the SFABs, the Security Force Assistance Brigades, and 
The SFABs are like Moby Dick. Everybody's heard of them, nobody's read them, but everybody's got an opinion on them. And so I want to help alleviate some of that lack of uh, knowledge about what the SFABs truly are, uh, the context you may have from Afghanistan and Iraq when we were built versus what we are doing now. That's one of the things I want to talk about. Uh, but also, since this is, you know, we're supposed to be talking strategy, we are a tactical formation. But I would argue, and I think I can defend that here today, that we have strategic impact, both in competition and if it leads to con conflict, I think we will be very well placed for that. Uh, just some context uh, on, you know, we're only about 5,000 advisors total, Compo 1 and Compo 2. Uh, today we've got 71 teams, about 582 advisors across 36 countries in the globe. So we, we are in the competition space today. Uh, the, most of those, 29 of those, are persistent engagements. The other seven are, uh, are episodic uh, and, and I, I talk about the difference between those two, uh, but we are out there in the space right now. We are an inside force. If the AD, A2AD bubble comes up that we were talking about, uh, we're already there. Now that comes with some challenges, uh, but that is a lot different than an exercise program where you've just got people there for a couple of weeks, short period of time for limited training objectives uh, compared to folks that are on the ground uh, and for six months at a pop, heel to toe. So again, you know, we're, we're in the competition space today, uh, but also if it comes to it, we, we, will, we will be critical in conflict. Okay, uh, with that, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're in an academic environment, so I want to make sure we get our terms straight. Um, you know, what is security force assistance versus security cooperation versus security force assistance? Um, you know, security cooperation is, you know, a whole bunch of different things. The whole of government can be security cooperation, not just military. It can be, you know, paramilitary. It can be uh, all sorts of different things. But the area that we primarily work in is security force assistance and security assistance. And so uh, Carl Clark's around here somewhere. There he is. You know, from SATMO, we work with SATMO teams in USASAC, the Security Assistance Command, out of uh, Huntsville, Alabama, Brigadier General Nicholson's my BFF, because uh, you can see we overlap in a lot of the places that, uh, that we operate. Uh, but we are primarily focused on security force assistance, but as, we, as we've learned over time, uh, we, we also go over into that security assistance space. Um, you know, security assistance is, is a lot of FMS training assistance, and that's, think of delivering the stuff, some specific kit, Everything from you know little bitty trinkets that soldiers carry on their body all the way up to major end items like HIMARS, M1 tanks. Everybody's heard about that stuff that's going on in Eastern Europe. And so where the FMS and USASAC can deliver those things and SATMO can do some initial fielding, uh, they're not there for six months at a time, heel to toe like we are. And so we, what we found is we can pick up on some of that stuff and not just show them the buttonology of how to shoot the HIMARS, we can talk about how do you fight with the HIMARS? How do you train and develop a training methodology to sustain readiness within your formations uh, with an M1 tank or something along those things, something along those lines. Uh, you can see our force structure up there. Uh, like I said, we've got uh, Compo 1 and Compo 2. 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 are the Compo 1 brigades. Each one of those is regionally aligned. The 6th Brigade is not called 6th Brigade, it's called 54th because it is a Compo 2 National Guard Brigade and it takes the National Guard in all 54 states uh, to, in, in territories to contribute to build the 54th. Uh, I like to tell people, you know, the sun never sets on the SFAC uh, and the sun definitely never sets on the 54th Brigade because they have, they have literally got uh, uh, Compo 2 advisors, they reinforce all of the, the other uh, uh, combatant commands, all the other brigades, and so they've literally got people across the world, uh, which is pretty important there. But that also means we've got some challenges, you know, building and sustaining readiness within that Compo 2 force that's constantly being churned. That, that is a different model than what the National Guard is used to, so we've, we've had some, uh, a steep learning curve on figuring that out, and we're still sorting through that. And then all the way over to the right, you can see 3rd of the 353rd Armored uh, Regiment, that's 3rd Battalion, uh, that's down at Fort Polk. That's what's left of Tiger Land and the Army's uh, advisor academy-like uh, uh, 
force generation model that they had that built mits, spits, pits, and a lot of those things, as well as if you were a YS tasker and you got sent down there for a two-week course to learn what an embassy looked like and those types of things, uh, that's what's left of what used to be a brigade-sized formation. They work for us. Uh, I use them as an ops group. They help facilitate the collective level training that we've got for the formation. Um, so they, they're not deployable. They're primarily helping uh, facilitate the training because uh, as you can see there down at the bottom, the brigades are purpose built. Uh, so it's no longer the ad hoc, we're gonna take a bunch of individuals, send them to Fort Riley for 90 days, build that team ad hoc, and then send them over to Iraq or send them to Afghanistan. That's not what we are doing. Uh, we are a purpose built. We're in the you know, for change of force structure. We're MTO units, we have colors. You know, the, I used to tell people, they go, you're just like a MIT or a PIT. And I'm like, you know, where's the MIT headquarters? You know, where are the MIT colors? They, they didn't have those. Those are provisional formations. But what the Army recognized in General Milley's vision was, hey, we need to quit doing this ad hoc. We need to make a professional uh, advisory capability. And so that's what we have done there, okay? And then finally, um, you know, we've, we've got some evolving doctrine uh, coming out of the Army's 3.0 multi-domain operations, last Friday, uh, CAC slapped the table on uh, FM 322, which is uh, Army Support to Security Force Assistance, uh, which was last updated 10 years ago. A lot's changed in the last 10 years. And so we've got some fresh doctrine that is, you know, it's one of those things I, I wish I'd had, uh, you know, five years ago when we were building the brigades because it really helps define that competition, crisis, conflict, space, and the role of security force assistance, everything from USASAC's role to the SFAB's role, what the theater army does to set the theater, uh, what the real purpose of uh, security force assistance is, build interoperability to set the conditions to you know, win in conflict. Uh, so if you haven't read that, it's, it's official now. It's 322. Uh, I've read it cover to cover a couple of times. It's a great document. And you know, now that it's in doctrine, uh, they're going to have to teach it in PME. And people actually know what SFA is. So that's a good thing. OK? And, I, and I'm going to talk. i got about 10, 20 minutes uh, talking. And then we can do Q&A. But if you want to jump in and interrupt, please don't hesitate. Okay, uh, the last thing there is it's got the, the numbers, and I'm, I'm gonna dig into that a little bit uh, more there, but like I said, it's only, there's only about 5,000 of us if we, were, if we were fully manned and we're not, uh, we're not at 100% strength just because we are an all-volunteer force within an all-volunteer force, which means we're an all-recruited force. So we've, you know, we've gotta convince people that they wanna come to us, and so that, sometimes that's a challenge. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, Back one. So, you know, why we were built, you know, we were originally built, and I'm going to show you the timeline. We were originally built for, uh, you know, Afghanistan. Uh, but that that is that has changed, and you can see Secretary Austin up there, uh, you know, talking about our relationships, and we talked about the enduring alliance and partnerships and how important those are within the national security strategy and the national defense strategy. And so we have seen that, you know, beyond Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, in the competition space, if you want to have those relationships, you need to have people there to maintain those relationships. It's one thing to say, hey, I value your friendship. I really value your, you know, what you can provide for us. But if you're not you know, boots on the ground, you know, face to face with people, then they kind of just go, OK, you know, prove it to me kind of stuff. So uh, we, we were built for a specific purpose. Uh, but now that's evolved. And so talking about building partner capacity and capability, the interoperability piece is critical as we look at conflict, and that's something that we are continuing to evolve and learn about. And then uh, facilitating the brigade combat team readiness. That's the true return on investment, and it's nine to one. In a 36-month period, uh, we are covering down on missions that would take nine brigade combat teams out of the total Army force uh, which enables those BCTs to train and focus on conflict and not to rip the leaders out of those brigades, send them off on a regionally aligned mission, or cobble up that brigade to do small little tasks. Uh, one, one of the things that's been a consistent message is uh, where we are sending a 12 advisor team, um, if there weren't advisors to do that, the theater armies would be asking for companies. 
and to, to do the same, to provide the same capability as far as partnership. So big return on investment when it comes to allowing the Army to take this one brigade size element but free up nine BCTs uh, to build readiness for the joint force. Uh, and that's pretty important there. In the middle there, you can see we originally designed, again, remember Afghanistan, so we were designed around an IBCT construct. Uh, and that, you know, when we, when we organized, that's what it was all about. It was about, all about Afghanistan. I'm going to, you know, we're, we're relooking that. We've got to relook that as we continue to evolve. But we've got three maneuver formations, engineer, artillery, and sustainers. They are all advisors, though. All 800 of them are advisors. That BSB, that's sustainment battalion, that's a sustainment advising battalion. There's no Charlie Med medical capability. And so, you know, when we talk about what's our role in conflict, uh, that, that has implications. We were just talking earlier today about the challenges of logistics uh, in large-scale combat operations. Uh, it's, it's a big challenge if you're the only Americans completely embedded and surrounded by a partner force and the closest other US forces are hundreds if not thousands of miles away. And so that's something that we continue to try to sort out. Uh, we do have a selection process, um, except for my command. My command, again, my headquarters, uh, which is a TDA formation. All of the brigades have a selection process to make sure we are getting the right folks. They're volunteers but they've also got to go through a selection process because just because you are a great squad leader doesn't mean you're going to be a great advisor. Just because you're a great company troop battery commander doesn't mean you're going to be a great advisor. And it doesn't mean you're not a great person. Uh, it just means you may not have the same attributes um, that, that we value. Uh, and so that's pretty important. So we have a selection process. Uh, we have a, com uh, a combat advisor training course that is run by the Military Advisor Training Academy at Fort Benning. Uh, it's a TRADOC school. It doesn't belong to us. Uh, it belongs to the Armor Center, but the Armor Center, we have a great relationship with them. They're totally supportive of us. Uh, they've revised the POI for that course several times. Again, it was very focused on Afghanistan. Uh, we are now working uh, into that program, how we can make it more focused on competition space as well as enabling conflict, uh, training advisors for conflict. But that is, that is our school, and, I, and it's a requirement. I've told everyone, everyone goes to that school. So you, know, you, you show up, you make it through assessment selection, you show up, and we get you on the roster and send you to that school so that we've all got a foundation uh, of um, understanding of, of what that looks like. It's a 41 day school uh, at Fort Benning. And the question I get asked a lot is culture and language training. And you know, we are not soft. Uh, we do not send people to DLI. Uh, we do not have a purpose built language program like they have at SWIC at Fort Bragg. Uh, we, we don't have the bandwidth and we don't have the time available for the folks that we get. We are a conventional force. We are not a branch, it's a unit of assignment. You come to us, uh, we send you to some schools, we send you to some specific schools depending on your MOS, but we do not have the time to send you to DLI for 52 weeks of language training or to go through the SWIC courses which are you know, six months long. We just don't have the time to do that. Uh, not to mention, um, you know, if you're going to 1st Brigade which is regionally aligned with Southcom, boom, go learn Spanish. Uh, but if you're in 5th Brigade, which is in the Indo-PACOM region, it's like, okay, which, which language do I teach you? Uh, there's plenty. Uh, and so we, we, we have not been able to do that. I, I don't think we're going to be able to, uh, to solve that problem. But one of the things that we have recognized, and, and this, you know, we learned this uh, several years ago talking to the Brits uh, who had some similar uh, SFAB-like formations, was they said, look, the language is really hard, takes a long time. The money is made by cultural training and understanding the culture that you're getting ready to be immersed in and, and understanding how to deal with those folks because that, that I can teach you their culture in English. And so it's a little bit uh, faster learning rate. And so we spent some time uh, figuring that out. The fact that we are going heel to toe and so we've got you know, advisors in that, in that country that can talk to the advisors that are coming into that country, that helps facilitate that cult cultural understanding as well. And so that's really important. And then I mentioned it before, that's one of our bumper stickers there, one captain, one team, one country. That's not always the case, but there are 
there are captains out there that are alone and unafraid with 11 other advisors, and they're the only US Army conventional force in that country. And they are doing incredible things, and, and you know, I couldn't be prouder of all of them. And they are definitely meeting the needs of the theater army commanders and the, uh, the global command or the geographic combatant commands because, as we talked about, the insatiable desire for more combat power. When I do Battlefield Cirque, every, everybody I sit down, they're like, hey, Don, how do I get more advisors? And I'm like, you got all I can give. Uh, so they, they are doing good things. Uh, depending on the country, you know, we have, you know, battalion level teams, the so battalion commanders, we have major led teams. Those are the company commanders, company troop battery commanders, but it could be just that one team led by that captain. Okay. Um, all right, next slide, please. So the, the next one is uh, to give everybody a little bit more context on where we are now versus, you know, what a lot of people, again, who've heard of Moby Dick, know there's a big white whale and a dude trying to hunt him down, but they never actually read the book. So this is the Reader's Digest version of the book. Uh, so on the left side of the slide, you know, we were built specifically for Afghanistan. The exord that the Army wrote said tactical advising at the Kandak level. Only one army at the time that had Kandex, that was the Afghan army, so we understood what that was. That statement drove everything in the dot mil PFP that occurred at a very rapid rate, much faster than the normal seven years to build a formation. Um, and so that drove how we were everything. You know, how we thought, how we built that school, how, why there are the MOSs and the, and the requirements on each one of those teams, all of those things drove what we are doing. And the intent was we were going to build five active one guard brigades. They were going to, we were going to build them. We were going to validate them in sequence. That was going to take roughly a year. Uh, you know, we got, you know, first brigade did it in less than a year. Second brigade, I stood up second brigade. We had 14 months. Each brigade got a little bit more time to build, but the intent was we would all cycle through Afghanistan. And then after we'd done our one rotation to Afghanistan as a brigade, you know, that's roughly five years, we thought, okay, maybe it'll be drawn down to where Afghanistan will be supportable by 3rd Brigade, which is aligned against CENTCOM, and then you would have a sustainable model, and that would enable the regional alignment. But we thought that was, we were going to have about five years. We thought about right about now that we would be finally getting into that full-up regional alignment. Well, needless to say, things moved a little bit faster in Afghanistan, and uh, not everybody did full up brigade deployments. First Brigade did, Second Brigade did, we handed off to Third Brigade, part of Fourth Brigade did. Fifth Brigade never went to Afghanistan. Because of the drawdown there, because of, uh, of uh, the way the policy was, and because as soon as they knew they weren't gonna send them to, to uh, Afghanistan, um, U.S. Army Pacific said, we want advisors, we've got a need for them in the Pacific. And so even before they had their activation ceremony, they had advisors in theater uh, helping to develop that theater and figure out what was going on. So that, that regional alignment happened a lot faster than we thought. And so that's really the, the, purple, the purple phase there. And then as people started, you know, people, you know, like on the COCOM staffs and in the theater staff started seeing what we could do. So, you know, 2020 now you've got 3rd um, Brigade is still in Afghanistan. 2nd Brigade, we had just come back. We're getting ready to go to AFRICOM. 2nd Brigade's aligned against AFRICOM. 1st Brigade was already moving people into SOUTHCOM, but was also doing recce for 2nd Brigade to get us ready to go to AFRICOM. 2nd Brigade was doing recce for 4th Brigade and UCOM. I mean, so the, the demand signal just ratcheted up very quickly. Uh, and so people started saying, hey, we, these are very capable forces. We want to start writing them into the O plans. And so all of a sudden, again, that regional alignment started to gain some momentum of its own. Uh, we pretty much got that sorted out, but oh, by the way, that was in the midst of the plague that we all went through, and so that was somewhat challenging, again, to get people into theater, get people into the various countries, bring them back in a timely manner. So there was a lot of learning of what this regional alignment looked like, but it was also challenged by COVID and the plague. And then all of a sudden, in uh, February 22, actually January 22, uh, when, when Americans, you know, the U.S. is telling everybody, hey... <laughs> They're coming. Um, we surged 4th Brigade assets into UCOM AOR to include the brigade team to help 
uh, with the, the pending crisis that we saw that was coming with uh, Russia, and that was based on UCOM and USOR saying, hey, we want more advisors in here. Uh, the brigade av advisor team led by the brigade commander, Colonel Rob Bourne, uh, they went to Romania and they helped the Romanians stand up their uh, land component commands, common operational picture as NATO forces flowed into Romania. All of a sudden, all these people started showing up and they needed to create an operational headquarters that they, they hadn't done before. And so we helped them with that. We got some augmentation on the space uh, in the air defense to build the... Uh, the air cop as well, uh, but that was, you know, now we're really beyond Afghanistan and we're looking hard at this uh, cr definitely in crisis uh, and okay, potentially conflict. Uh, we even took some of the folks uh, from 3rd Brigade and sent them to Europe because CENTCOM was still figuring out how to set the theater based on, you know, they lost all their OCO money, they needed to re-wicker some funding and some authorities. So it was getting pretty dynamic in 2022. And with that, with the uh, advent of the National Security Strategy and National Defense Strategy, and the Chief's comment up there, you know, the, the, the uh, Secretary had said, hey, we're the leading edge of campaigning. So we got that. We're out there, regionally aligned, we're campaigning. We're in the competition space. Then Chief's like, hey, you know, you're a conflict force. And so we're like, yes, we are. Uh, we better figure that out. And that's a little bit different you know, hey, I'm going to go hang out and I'm going to teach you how to, you know, I can teach Afghans to shoot rifle AKs. Uh, I can run an NCO academy. I can help develop your NCO core. That's a little different than I'm going to enable joint fires. We're going to, you know, help you maneuver forces in conflict uh, against a peer threat kind of stuff. So while we were already regionally aligned, you know, the reason I colored that 2022 green is we really started, you know, wrestling internally, hey, what's conflict mean for us? Uh, and there were a lot of people in the Army that were like, oh, you're, you're counterinsurgency, you do stability ops. And we were like, no, no, you, the chief said we're conflict, so we need to do that. And so we've spent the last year figuring out what that looks like, and that meant getting back to the combat training centers, not to validate ourselves, which is what we did when we built the brigades, but to integrate with rotational units in higher headquarters and understand how we could help with our coalition partners on the left and right of the U.S. forces to either enable the U.S. forces or to enable those coalition partners. We also integrated into the Warfighter program. Last year, the first one was with First Corps. And then uh, about two weeks ago, I was down at Fort Hood for third, third, uh, Three Corps uh, Warfighter, and that has been huge. You know, the, the recent Warfighter was the largest Warfighter um, that they've ever executed, and it was the first Warfighter where, you know, when they flipped the switch, and you know they're attacking. You've got U.S. conventional forces with partner forces essentially behind enemy lines because they were surrounded uh, as the Denovians came in, and that created options for the you know the core commander that you know he otherwise wouldn't have had. And so that's you know we're learning, uh, the theaters are learning, the partners are learning, and the army is learning how we can be employed in conflict. And that's a lot different than you know, teaching, teaching uh, Afghans how to shoot AKs. And so that's where we're continuing to go. How do we stay in that competition space, keep the demand signal, feeding the demand signal from the combatant commands, but also ensuring that we are training advisors who can operate in the competition space, but also if they flip the switch, we can ramp up to conflict in short order, okay? So next slide, let's talk about how that, how that works. Back up one. And so, you know, th this is that, that, that continuum there, competition crisis, and then conflict. Uh, I think General Ellison said, or somebody said earlier this morning, it may not be, it may have been Ian, that it goes immediately from, you know, competition to conflict. And so that is, that is one of the things that we wrestle with. The hardest part, you know, and they tell you this at the CTCs, you know, how do you manage transitions? Uh, and for us as advisors on the ground, you know, we've got advisors in Georgia, uh, which oh, the Republic of, not the state of, uh, and they, they have they actually share a border with Russia, uh, but those advisors don't have weapons because the Georgians have said you can't have weapons. Uh, and so we're in the competition space. We're working with the Georgians. They, they want us there. We've increased the number of advisors that are there. But if that goes from competition to conflict really fast, uh, I got to FedEx some enforce to those advisors and, uh, you know, you know, 
Maybe they pay their Amazon Prime and it'll get there overnight, but maybe not. Uh, and so we're, we're wrestling with that. How do we do that? Uh, and that's, you know, Georgia is one example. There, there are several other examples of that. Uh, and so th these are the things that we are looking at that we, we need to, uh, to sort out so that we can, you know, we want to stay in, in the competition space or we want to get back to the competition space as quickly as possible. But, you know, we've got to be integrated. People have got to know we're there. We are conventional force. We're not covert. We're not low-vis. We're not soft. Uh, so it's, you know, if we're there, we're there. People know we're there. So that's part of deterrence. Um, you know, the interoperability piece, we, you saw where we're integrated in the O plans. So we're trying to facilitate interoperability uh, with the partners. So if there is a flow of U.S. forces in, that we can help facilitate that. You, you know, interoperability is, you know, the people, the systems processes, and the technology. Well, the, I think the most important of those is the people. Uh, because you, you got technology, you got system process, you don't have people to run it, it doesn't work. Well, we're, we're the people for the U.S. Army to enable interoperability. And so that's something that, that we have taken on, uh, building the green cop, you know, showing the joint force where, or the CFLIC, whoever we're working for, where the partners are to enable uh, decision making and operations. And that's in the crisis. Um, it, we are you know, demonstrating results. We are boots on the ground but it's not a brigade combat team. It's not 5,000 of us. It doesn't take a week to get us there. We're already there. It's only a dozen. So we, we, we try not to you know, run around and break things, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, you, know, you take a brigade combat team. If you take an armor brigade combat team somewhere, you're going to run over something. You're going to break something. You're going to upset somebody. It's they're not because they're bad people. It's just the nature of, uh, of the stuff that they've got. We're a little bit uh, more subtle, a little bit more deft in our footprint, and, and, but we are still U.S. soldiers, and so we are demonstrating that resolve. The positional advantage, I already talked about that. You know, we are, we're an inside force. They flip the A2AD bubble on, we're, we're inside it already. Uh, and we've got some pretty, uh, pretty capable comm systems that will, uh, that will still enable us to operate. And then again, if it goes to conflict, uh, we can do all of those things. Um, the, uh, the resolve of having a U.S. You know, soldier embedded with a partner force, a partner headquarters at Echelon potentially, that, that's commitment, that's resolve. Uh, it also gives us insight, something that the chief's always you know, dumping me in the chest going, you know, will they fight? You know, pick, pick a partner. You know, he's got the scar tissue we all do of Afghanistan. You know, will they fight? And so we do assessments. And that's really the, the dial up there at the top that you can see adjust depending on where we are on that spectrum. In the competition space, we do a lot of advising. Uh, but as you get back over to that conflict, you know, we're fighting. We're not doing a lot of advising. We're doing a lot of supporting joint fires, joint ISR, you know, joint comms, those types of things. We're doing a lot of liaising, you know, wit between them and our units, sometimes between, you know, them and, and, and other folks, uh, interagency, those kinds of things. Uh, and then, but, but in all of them, and wherever we are, we're always assessing, you know, what's their will to fight? What's their capability to fight? What's their capacity to continue to do the things that, that they need to do or that we want them to do? Uh, one of the war fighters, uh, you know, I was watching, and uh, they're like, they saw advisors partnered with this formation, and so they started tasking the advisors to do things. And I was like, no, no, <laughs> you're not tasking us. You, you, what you're telling us is you want the partner to do that. And then what we owed them back was the feedback is, you know, are they capable of doing that? Can they achieve what you want them to achieve? So that's, that's how we think we fit on on that spectrum. And so next slide, next couple of slides just give some examples in each one of those. Like I said, you know, we're in the competition space right now. I covered a lot of those things. The lesson learned down there, persistent presence equals enduring effects. That is something new. We have got advisors in countries where we have never had an extended US uh, Army conventional footprint over time. Uh, and, and that's relatively new since it's only been a couple of years that we've, we've been in this space. And that's, that's enduring effects. Those relationships, it's not just you know, the person-to-person -person relationships, it's the relationship of that institution, that military, with the U.S. Army 
that's a relationship that matters over time. Uh, the individual relationships are priceless, but the organizational to organizational relationships that you get from spending that, that constant uh, togetherness is pretty important. Uh, the regional persistent and presence, again, you know, resolve in the area. You can get effects over time uh, as opposed to a, again, a, a um, exercise program that's, you know, it's a blip and then it goes away. Okay, and like I said down there, we are helping the theater army commanders set the theater because we are an inside force, okay? Uh, and and that, that's a big green advise. So go to the next slide and the, the advise gets smaller as it goes into crisis and the liaise uh, and the support gets a little bit better, bigger. Uh, and so, you know, the campaign activities are, are decreasing uh, so that we can get other formations into the fight. And so for instance, when we surged um, forces in Eastern Europe in a couple of cases, uh, even within theater, as they moved US forces up into the Baltics, some of the first people to meet those forces on the ground were advisors who were already in country. And so think of it, you know, US coalition force gets, uh, or US conventional force gets a frag, oh, hey, get on a plane, take your company, troop, battery, battalion, whatever, you're going to this country. They're like, okay, got it. And they get off the, the plane and boom, there's a smiling American. It's like, hey, how's it going? I'm Don Hill. We got a place for you set up already. Here are your partners. This is what's going on. This is the initial timeline. So that's us liaising with our own formations, doing RSO and I, help speed up that uh, buildup of combat power. Okay, uh, you know, down there, if you're not early, you're late. We are, we're early, we're there. And I don't think that that can be overlooked and how important that is. And again, we're, we're not a big footprint, but very capable and enable quite a bit uh, for the rest of the force if they move in in crisis. And then also, you know, there's smaller crisis where we don't flow in a bunch of forces. And we've had several examples uh, of where we've been present with our partners just to help out. Uh, whether it's, you know, humanitarian aid, there's a plane crash uh, in um, Somalia, there's uh, flooding in South America, and, and we're there, and that's, you know, Americans showing we are committed to our partners, and we're there to help out, okay? Uh, go to the, uh, the next slide there. And then we get into the conflict, and like I said, you know, you, you, you know, we're building interoperability and competition because you don't want to wait until the bullets are flying to try to figure out interoperability. It's kind of important. Uh, we can enable joint fires. Uh, one of the requirements when we built was all of our 13 Foxes, all of our observers uh, need to be joint JFOs so that they can, uh, you know, facilitate joint fires. That's pretty important when it comes to support. That's, that's generally what the partners want. Hey, what have you done for me lately? I want to see some joint fires out there. Uh, as well as our Intel folks, and the ISR capabilities that they can, they can help with. So pretty important. Again, this is something we are continuing to evolve and figure out uh, over time in, uh, in our role in the CTCs or our engagement in the CTCs uh, and, and the warfighter programs are pretty important to do that. And then go to the final slide here. I talked about building, uh, buying back the readiness there on the top left. Okay, unity of effort and unity of action is key. The SFA in a complex world, that slide on there on the right that's embedded in there, that's, that's not in any manual. That's something that my staff put together. It's, 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 not, it's not the standard. That's just everybody, you know, kind of a, hey, let's just throw all these people that we think are in security cooperation, security force assistance that, that we touch or that, that have an influence on what we do and what our partners do. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, there's not unity of command, uh, you know, below like the SecDef level. Uh, uh, and, and even when you get into theaters, um, you know, it, it, it's pretty crazy. Um, but, you know, what we want is unity of effort and unity of action, and that's what we are aspiring to achieve, and we're getting better in some places than we are in others. An example of that's the bottom, that photo in the bottom left there, I think that's in Panama, and, you know, that's um, SATMO trainers, uh, that's uh, First uh, Special Forces Command ODA and advisors from First SFAB all together in Panama, uh, collectively working with the Panamanians. Uh, and so we are out there together in that competition space and we are, we're, we're working hard to get that unity of effort uh, to help the, the theater armies um, set the theater. 
Uh, and then, you know, the, the, the partnerships that we're building there with the Bulgarians and, and the Brits, uh, you know, battle group, you know, battle group's kind of like a COCOM. You see one battle group, you see one battle group. Uh, but, you know, it, it's, it's an interoperability nightmare. We're trying to help with that where we can based on how USER uh, wants to use us. Um, there's some doctrine there. We're rewriting 396.1. That's the brigade. Right now, it's really focused on coin. We're trying to get that, that LISCO stuff in there. I already talked about 322. Uh, and we are, as I said, our, our, our organization was all about Afghanistan. Uh, we want it to be more uh, focused on the whole spectrum, not just that stability uh, counterinsurgency type operations. Uh, so we're, we're doing a complete gap study to look at where we, uh, we, know, we don't have any expectations of growth. Uh, just based on where the Army's at, but we need to re-look at how we are organized in, in our equipment. I just had a commander's forum last week. We re-looked our business rules about how we are being employed um, so that we can be more effective in meeting the demand signal from the theater commanders. Okay, I think that's the last slide here. I threw a lot at you pretty fast, but I'm open for questions, conversations, or we can just stare at each other since my doppelganger said I had an hour, and that's what I would use. <laughs>